Okay. All right, so I hope my screen is sharing. All right, so greetings everyone and welcome to the Innovations in Aging Research Webinar Series. I will be your host for this afternoon. My name is Noemi Mauri Lensa. I'm a research professor in the Philippines and my current um, research interest is on sound and acoustics in rehabilitation in ger geriatrics. Right. So this webinar is brought to you by the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine, Aging Research and Geriatric Rehabilitation Networking Group. We are currently welcoming new members. So if you're interested, kindly visit our webpage. It's flashed on the screen or contact our chairperson, Dr. Patricia Hine. We would love to hear from you and undertake collaborative work on aging research. This is really one of the fun things to do in this organization. So please come and join us. Additionally, um, the ACRM is inviting everyone to attend the 98th annual conference. It's in September, so that's roughly two months away. It is completely virtual, so it's accessible to anyone and everyone across the globe. So please visit www.acrm.org 2021 to get a glimpse of the virtual program and to check out the rates that best suit your preferences. We hope to see you there. For this afternoon, our speaker is Dr. Pierre Filippo de Sanquis, and he will be speaking on EEG track gait, providing an unprecedented window in the neurophysiology of cognitive and motor um, research. Motor aging, motor aging. So before we get started, uh, I would like to advise everyone that this meeting is recorded. That includes me. <laughs> and um, I'd like to request all attendees to please keep your phones and microphones um, turned off or muted and your cameras, please turn it off also throughout the presentation. We do expect to have about 20 minutes um, discussion at the end of the webinar. So if you have questions, um, please type them in the chat feature and we will address as many as those as we can during the latter part of the hour. Of course, we are very much thankful for everybody for taking their time to sit and join us this afternoon. Perfect for tea time. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for this afternoon. So Dr. Pierre Filippo de Sanctis is a cognitive neuroscientist with a research history in basic neurophysiology of geriatric, psychiatric, and neurological disorders. His interests are on tasks designed to measure interactions between sensory, motor, and cognitive functions, while the subjects engage in complex real-world behaviors, such as dual task walking and gait initiation. His current focus is on application of EEG-based mobile brain body imaging, or the MOBI, on synchronized recordings of gait kinematics and electrocortical activity during treadmill walking. Dr. DeSantis is the current assistant professor of the Department of Pediatrics and Neurology of Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He is also the project director in cognitive aging of the Division of Cognitive and Motor Aging and Cognitive Neurophysiology Laboratory of Albert Einstein College of Medicine. So ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Pierre Filippo de Sanctis. And uh, Dr. Deflor is yours. So let me just pull down my slides and you can pull up yours. Thank you very much, Naomi, for the introduction. And I'm excited to be with you guys. Um, you share my screen. Can you see this? Yes, yes, we do. Yeah. Go ahead. So um, I don't know um, if something is unclear or so, uh, I think feel free to interrupt me or, or I think that makes sense. 
the group is not that big that we can we can maybe do that but hopefully everything is uh, as clear as possible so i'm um, doing mobi um, which is a new field in collecting eeg data and uh, this term mobile brain body imaging uh, was coined by scott mccake uh, about 10 years ago um, uh, was the idea to use EEG in, in a different way. Uh, typically, EEG is used uh, while people are not, not moving much, uh, mostly just moving a finger or so to uh, respond to a stimulus. And the idea would be to, uh, to prevent contamination of the EEG recording, EEG uh, being the recording of uh, activity uh, from the cortex. Uh, and contam not contaminated by EMG, by muscle activity, but more to that uh, uh, later. Uh, so uh, let me start this disclosure on funding. Uh, I have nothing to disclose, and uh, I have funding from the National Institute of Aging. I had the opportunity to cross enroll um, my sample from a bigger R01 that is also funded by the National Institute of Aging, uh, Central Control of M Mobility and Aging. And I was also supported by startup funds uh, assigned to Dr. Mohan, Dr. Fox. Uh, here's an overview. Uh, I'm going to start talking about GATE uh, as a macro function, which involves uh, uh, the integration of many different uh, processes. Uh, I will ca characterize GAID as a, also as a basic activity of everyday living. Uh, everyday living activities are assessed and are central to the diagnosis of dementia, which makes GAID uh, a possible or a sensitive uh, assay to um, assess uh, dementia progression. And then I will make the argument that there's a knowledge gap in our understanding of everyday function during the early stages of dementia, and that closing this gap might improve our understanding of preclinical pre pre dementia stages. Uh, I will then present some findings from the, from the CCMA study, the Cognitive Control of Mobility and Aging study, that is in support of uh the notion the idea that there are subtle limitations in everyday activities that we can uh, that are important and um, relevant during the pre-mci stage and then i will switch then to mobile brain body imaging uh, which i said is another way to record eg and it provides the opportunity to look at brain correlates of everyday activity and particularly gate. And then uh, I will talk about uh, recent findings that we are just working up um, for publication that are focused on the MCA stage, MCI stage. Um, so we have people walk under the influence of visual proprioceptive conflict. And I will explain in a second what that is. So what, what do I mean with gate is a macro function? Um, Gate uh, performed in complex environment relies equally on sensory, motor, and cognitive processes uh, to safeguard uh, navigation and to walk from A to B uh, and to be able to interact with what happens in this very complex environment we live in. Uh, Gate is also a basic activity of daily living. There are six and mobility is one of them and uh, everyday functions basically assess our ability to independently perform daily activity traditionally um, activities are classified as basic and instrumental basic are you know self-care and mobility and, and instrumental activities are things that are required to uh, to you know to live an independent life like shopping and using the phone and managing your finance and uh, medication uh, so as i said assessment of these 
activity is central for the diagnosis of pre-dementia and dementia syndrome. And basic activity are intact during the MCI stage, but uh, mild problems in performing instrumental activities might um, exist. So uh, especially more complex activities may require greater effort or accommodation. Now, it is generally assumed that uh, our ability to perform these functions is unimpaired until a certain degree of, of cognitive decline has been reached. And because of the general assumption, it is largely unknown whether there are minor limitations in everyday function before people reach the criteria of MCI, of my cognitive impairment. So in uh, that uh, central control of mobility and aging, in this study, that is um, a longitudinal cohort study of 450 community residing older individuals. And we, we set out to um, ask the questions, are there milder limitations before people uh, reach um, the stage of MCI? And so to test that, we examined everyday functional profiles in cognitively older individuals who went on to meet criteria for incident MCI during follow-up and compared their profiles to uh, older adults who remain cognitively normal. And our hypothesis was that the frequency of milder limitation in complex and instrumental activity at baseline is higher in those who go on to develop MCI. So we use the late life function and disability instrument. Here is our 10 uh, items. Uh, it's a questionnaire, uh, like uh, your ability to visit friends and family, uh, to travel out of town. Uh, it asks uh, how about hobbies and pastime. And so people score it from five um, that would mean no difficulties uh, to one, can't do any more. And in between are more subtle um, gray shades of difficulties. So four would be just a little, three somewhat, and two a lot. So over a follow-up of three years, uh, what we found was um, that uh, about 300 people remain cognitively normal and 69 were diagnosed as MCI. And in terms of limitation, uh, what we found is here's a whole list of um, activities. And what you see is here, the raw score here in percent for people that are normal and uh, for people that receive the diagnosis of MCI. And so these are the activity assessed at baseline before at a point where everybody was assessed as normal. And you can see that there are differences between people that go on, do not go on to develop MCI, and particularly in um, more complex activity, like traveling out of town, invite people to your own home and entertain. It seems like that there are subtle limitations that we can find uh, at baseline. Um, so let me summarize that. Um, there are milder limitations. They're still doing, of course, these uh, activities independently, but there are milder limitations in these more complex activities. And the prevalence is high in older adults that go on to develop MCI. And now going forward, we were interested in gaining insight into the neural signature of these uh, activities, specifically gait. And for that, we developed mobile brain body imaging. And uh, the data that I'm going to show today seeks to establish the link between Mobi signals and MCI. And then after that, uh, we also are interested to go farther 
farther back in the disease course and see if MOBI is also sensitive to pick up signal during the pre-MCI stage. So why gate? Um, as I said before, gate is not a complex, but a basic activity of daily living. However, gate is part and parcel to many more complex activity of daily living. And there's a large body of research uh, by uh, Dr. Vegese at Einstein and others that shows that uh, changes in quantitative gate markers like gate speed and uh, gate variability are robust predictors of dementia, falls, and frailty. So uh, let me switch to Moby. So in terms of our design, uh, we enrolled 27 older individuals from the CCNI study, and we compared older adults with and without MCI. Now in the study, MCI was defined based on the MOCA. And you had, a, you had to have a score of 27 and lower to be classified as MCI. So the MOCA is a global uh, measure of cognition, which includes memory, uh, visual spatial uh, processing speed. So it's a global cognitive measure. Uh, we did uh, mobile brain body imaging uh, to uh, establish neural signatures of gait in MCI. So uh, what is MOBI? Um, basically, um, this, this picture is a little bit misleading. Uh, I have to say at the beginning, um, sorry for that. What is missing is the harness. Uh, we don't have people walk on a treadmill without a harness. Uh, uh, there's always a harness, um, safety harness uh, that prevents people from falling. Um, but what a MOBI is, is basically synchronized recording of EEG with, um, with body kinematics. Uh, so on, what you see on the top of that room is uh, there are nine cameras basically, and we track, uh, we get a three dimensional image of your movement. Um, you, you have these reflectors, and these are infrared cameras and they sample your movement at 100 hertz. So you get a sample, a three-dimensional image of your body every 10 milliseconds. And we synchronize this uh, data stream with EEG um, to basically link these two data streams with millisecond precision. Uh, that gives us the, that allows us basically to look at brain gate relationships with millisecond precision. So in the, the experiment that I'm gonna show you, we, we designed a complex walking task. We created visual proprioceptive conflict. What we did is we exposed people to, an, to an, a large scale, um, large scale um, star field that radiates outward, which created the illusion of optical flow. Um, so you see the person walking on the treadmill here, it's immersed in this uh, virtual reality um, optical flow stimulus while they're walking in place on the treadmill. And there were two conditions. Uh, one where we showed this optical flow or this radiating out uh, star field uh, and introduce sideways shifts. So your environment, basically, you have the impression that your environment is shifting sideways. So we perturb the optical flow. And we compared your gait and your brain activity uh, to a control condition where we just projected dots onto the, onto the wall, they didn't move. So that's basically, uh, the control condition. And we wanted to understand better what the relationship is between gait and brain activity when you are exposed to this conflict in sensory information that we know destabilizes your balance and how this relationship is affected by my cognitive impairment. So um, I'm gonna 
just mention that shortly when you do EG while you walk, you have to deal with motion artifacts. And I'm just going to mention that. So we have these uh, EEG caps with 64 to 160 or even more channels, which allows us to measure the distribution of activity across the skull. And what you can see uh, is that um, muscle activity and brain activity uh, is the distribution of these sources is very different. So one main problem uh, while you walk is uh, your neck, neck muscle to stabilize your head. And as you can see uh, in the lower figure, the neck muscles, they project um, to the back of your head. Um, and the frequency of that activity is, uh, the amplitude of power is much higher uh, in general compared to brain activity that you see on the top. So we can, we capitalize on these features to uh, separate brain from motion artifacts. So, I think I showed this already. Oh, I'm going backwards. Okay, sorry. So, what does it mean to track uh, gait uh, with millisecond precision? So, I mentioned we have basically two data streams uh, OptiTrack or infrared cameras that, uh, have the, that creates a 3D image every 10 milliseconds. And so, what we do is we identify the moment of heel strike. And we time lock EEG activity to that moment. And uh, then we do time frequency analysis, uh, which allows us to look at brain oscillations and the power or the amplitude of these brain oscillations and how they change time lock to the heel strike. And we can separate gate from non gate related activity simply by. Uh, not, not so simply, but it, it works very well um, by averaging. Uh, so a person takes over 300 strides typically in our experiments. That means we can average across 300 strides, uh, brain activity, time locked to the heel strike. And if a signal is time locked to the heel strike, averaging will amplify that signal an activity that's not related to the heel strike will average out because it's sometimes positive and sometimes negative. So it goes towards zero. So that's one way to extract task related in this case, in this case, heel strike related activity and look at the activity as a function of your experimental conditions. So what is it we are actually measuring there? Uh, when I talk about neural oscillations, what we measure there, the main source of scalp recorded neural oscillations are postsynaptic potential generated at the cortical level. Um, that's the main source. Um, it's not uh, action potential, it's postsynaptic potentials. Uh, that is not to say you cannot record action potential, you actually can, but that's a different technique. Uh, so what we end up is these, uh, these, these traces are recorded at the skull. And then we can, and so these traces are oscillations, uh, many, many different oscillations on top of each other. So we can filter and look at specific uh, frequency bands that have been shown to be significant or relevant in the context of motor behavior and cognition. So I'm going to introduce uh, three studies uh, and introduce basically uh, two EEG signals or oscillations of interest. There is the mu and beta uh, oscillation, which means uh, it's eight to twenty-eight peaks per second, and I will also introduce the theta oscillation, uh, which is an oscillation between three and seven peaks per second. So the first EEG signal of interest um, is uh, 
mu and beta written over motor cortex. And if I ask you to simply move your finger, what you can see basically is your, just by looking at the EG activity, the, is a blocking of the mu and beta written over motor cortex. So at zero, I ask the person to prepare uh, to move the left or right finger. And what you can see as soon as, and at zero, at seven actually, uh, you can actually uh, measure some EMG activity. Uh, so the movement is being uh, performed. And before you can measure any EMG activity, you can see that the brain uh, switches its mode of oscillation from this high frequency, not high amplitude uh, frequency around eight to 20 Hertz. And it goes into this low amplitude, uh, more higher frequency uh, before and during, during uh, execution. And then it comes back when you are, when the finger is, stops moving again. So this is a very well established um, phenomena in uh, the investigation of motor behavior, uh, this EG. And we know that this, this, that blocking of this oscillation reflects disinhibition or activation over the motor cortex. And there is also distribution when before you move the finger, it's uh, lateralized to the contralateral side and during movement, movement, it's then bilateral distributed. And it turns out uh, a new study showed that the same thing happens when you walk. So in this case, um, we don't have a baseline uh, but because walking is ongoing. So we compare this in this study, we compared it against standing. And so this, what you see here is oscillation from three to 50 Hertz and zero is the heel strike and 100 is the next heel strike. And what you find is compared to standing, there is a blocking here signified in blue, a reduced amplitude within this frequency band. Again, it indicates that the motor cord is, is activated while we walk compared to standing. Now, this is the first signal that will we'll look at uh, in, in our study. And the second one is um, the theta ribbon. Now in this study, they had people walk on this balance beam and uh, they looked what happens um, when they fall off, when they lose balance. And that's what they found for the left sensory motor cortex, but also other regions. But uh, for that, it was mostly um, it was clearer side. So pick this one. So what, what you see here is the first step on the belt, uh, not, not on the belt, on the balance beam, the second step on the balance beam. And then this uh, dotted line here indicates a loss of balance. That's the moment when they step off to regain balance. They step off the balance beam and they step on the treadmill belt to regain balance. And so what they found is that before, just after you, the last step on the balance beam, when you basically know that you're gonna lose the balance and you're gonna need to step off, they show this amplification and this uh, frequency band. So these are the two uh, oscillations that we're gonna focus on. And uh, we'll focus on three brain regions. So when you have these GALP recordings, you can use inverse source localization to estimate where the sources are. You have a distribution, which allows you to estimate the most likely region uh, that uh, is responsible for that specific distribution over the cortex. And so that's what we did here. And each dot basically represents a source. Um, now, you, 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 you remember I told you we, we had 27 subjects here. So, and there are many more dots than 27. 
So what that is, is uh, so we use independent component analysis to identify brain sources. And in, on average, uh, a person contributes four to 10 sources um, that are classified as, as brain sources. And so we use cluster, uh, k-means clustering to basically uh, source uh, or to basically define the gate related network um, and you see these uh, sources localized to motor regions but they're also localized to visual regions and which makes sense because uh, we need to we need the visual cortex to be active when we when we do that so, but I'm going to focus on three areas, uh, premotor or supplementary motor area, left and right sensory motor cortex. And so we're going to look at uh, the power or the amplitude of these oscillations localized to these three regions. Uh, as I said, we're going to focus on theta and mu and beta. Our predictions were that uh, conflict, visual proprioceptive conflict, will lead to increased step width uh, in order to, in, in an effort to increase gait stability. <coughs> Sorry. And we predicted that this is particularly the case in people that are classified as MCI. And we also predicted that there are different MOBI signatures during conflict between cognitive normal and MCI. So here is our table one. We had 14 people that were classified as MCI and 13 people as cognitively normal. On average, there were 75 years and there was no difference between the groups. Here are the gender distribution. Uh, there was no difference in education. And by design, there was a difference in the MOCA I was 25 in MCI and 28 on average. They didn't differ in terms of depression, gait speed, height, and weight. Um, so, what happens with your gait when you are exposed to uh, conflict, sensory conflict? So, here I'm showing you um, the static condition. Uh, these are basically 13 or 14 dots uh, when in cognitive normal people and uh, step width uh, when you're exposed to uh, visual proprioceptive conflict. And you basically can see that there's not much of a difference between these two conditions in people with, uh, that are classified with cognitive normal. So what happens if you are classified as MCI uh, you can see that there's in, an increase uh, in step width uh, when they're exposed to conflict. So this data uh, confirms basically our prediction that uh, when, when I expose you to uh, sensory conflict, uh, people with a mocha smaller than 28 will increase step width, most likely in an effort to improve stability. Now, the next slide, I'm going to show you uh, Mobi signatures, and let me let me walk you through this. Uh, so, what you see uh, is uh, both groups together first, and so this is basically um, three to sixty hertz during static, and and here's the right heel strike left heel strike, right heel strike. And on average, these are per person 300 uh, trials that we average. Now, every stride is different in length. So what we need to do to average across all these strides is we have to time warp. We time warp the data matrix um, to the medium stride for that person. So that's what you see here. And that's, this is the left sensory motor cortex. 
as I said, for the whole group. So these are 27 subjects. Each subject has 300 to 500 strikes. And in, in, in that color, what you see is basically the power of a specific uh, brain oscillation. Now you, there's an opaque, opaque region and then there is uh, a, a more clear region and which indicates that only here in this frequency band, uh, it survives uh, the correction for multiple comparison. It's an FDA, FDR correction. So as we predicted, when people are exposed to conflict, what they do for the left sensory motor cortex, they block mu and beta which we know is disinhibition or activation of the motor cortex. So, and this is the difference basically between static and optic flow and uh, visual process conflict. So there's a significant difference, an uh, increase in activation of the left sensory motor cortex. So we have done that for the other regions too. And basically you see the same pattern roughly so you see stronger activation when they're exposed to conflict for all regions here. So what happens if you zoom in now, if you separate the groups and you zero in on these two frequency bands? So here is the whole group again, and here are cognitive normal people, and here are MCI people. And this is basically um, specifically for this frequency band, 15 to 25. So it's not the whole band, but specifically that, that brain oscillation. And what you can see is, again, when you are exposed to optical flow or conflict, uh, this, this function here is lower, which basically translates into the blocking of the swimming. And so it's true for all, for both groups. But if you look at the other areas, what you find is that there are significant group differences. So here for the premotor cortex, again, we see the difference between static and conflict, but there's actually a reverse pattern for people uh, with my cognitive impairment. And for the right sensory motor cortex, we see the same. There is a power reduction in this band. Uh, for cognitive normal, that is gone if you score uh, 27 and lower on the MOCA. Uh, so what happens is the beta band. There again, the two areas that uh, pop out are the premotor and the sensory motor cortex. Um, first, you see that uh, theta modulates quite a bit, but there is no different difference between the two conditions. But for the premotor and right sensory motor cortex, there is really not much going on in terms of differential activity uh, in cognitive normal, and all the actions basically are uh, in people with my cognitive impairment. Now notice here, it's the other way around. Uh, here with the mu beta, it's a reduction in power. With the theta, it's an increase in power uh, that we show. So, so the same brain region starts to oscillate and one oscillation is reduced in power, the other one is increased in power depending on the frequency band and the differences between groups. So um, in summary, I've shown you that in MCI, there are um, that uh, individuals increase step width under sensory conflict, and that there is a distinct uh, Moby signature. There is no blocking of the new beta ribbon over right sensory motor cortex and SMA. And there's a strong increase in theta power over right sensory motor cortex and SMA. And we know from other studies that theta is increased 
during instability and loss of balance. So our conclusion here is that our data suggests that people that score lower on the MOCA are more challenged by conflict, which lead to increased step width and increased data power in certain areas. And um, overall, I would basically finish by saying that mobile brain body Im imaging provides an unprecedented window into the neurophysiology of mobility and aging. And it will help to improve our understanding of early brain changes related to normal and pathological aging. And I'm left with thanking you for your attention. And uh, um, I'm pointing out uh, colleagues and friends that helped me with uh, this work. Thank you very much. All right. All right. So, oh, my, that is a very um, informative and very interesting talk, uh, Dr. DeSantis. All right. So the floor is open for questions. Um, is there anybody who would like to air out their questions to our speaker today? If you're shy, you can just uh, chat and then we'll read it out. So anyone can start asking questions. I can start off. Let's go ahead. Hi, Dr. DeSantis. Um, thank you for this presentation. Very, very helpful and very interesting. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was wondering if you can provide a little bit more information why you chose a visual conflict um, for patients with MCI. So there's different conflict paradigms, physical yeah. conflict paradigms, cognitive uh, co conflict paradigms, visual conflict paradigms. I was wondering why you chose the visual conflict paradigm. Was that because you expected that individuals with MCI um, have visual flow difficulties or was that because of the EEG that you wanted to make sure that there were no physical perturbations that might, might have affected the EEG recordings? Right. Yes, I mean, there are plenty of physical perturbations that are done in, in this line of research. Um, so we did, um, we did uh, visual uh, because there's a bunch of studies that show that um, not specifically to MCI, but in general that optical flow has a, a strong impact on, on the way you walk. So optical flow can, if you do overground walking and you're exposed to optical flow that is, that is perturbed, it can change the way you, the directionality of your walking. And there's a bunch of studies using this type of manipulation by this, uh, you know, uh, large scale visual uh, display. Uh, and they have shown that uh, gait is the way you walk changes um, as a function of uh, visual flow. We actually have a paper um, published in young people where we we did this and so the reason was not specific to MCI it was just we needed a paradigm that we knew will change the way you walk and we were interested in gate adjustment and how MCI will, will do with that that's basically our motivation thank you um, I have a question. Hi, Dr. De Sanctes. This is Malike from Marcus Institute for Aging Research. So Hi. I was, uh, I was wondering. Uh, so what was the reason that you used the camera system, the opti optokinetic? Like I see people usually use variable sensors to measure the gait. Yes. Uh, so what's the pros and cons uh, compared to variable sensors? And also, have you seen any correlations between the EEG outcomes and the gait metrics? Yes. And people at MCI. Um, I guess I mean so one big reason to use optic, optic or infrared cameras was to really measure velocity of gait, and for that you need uh, spatial and temporal information that you get. So if you have sensors, you you might get that too, but it's a little bit harder, I think. Uh, they mostly measure acid acceleration. Um, and the reason uh, 
why we wanted velocity is that treadmill walking really is a is a is a task um, by itself what you need to do is you need to adjust your gait speed all the time to make sure you're not falling off the treadmill and so the idea was also to really so we have a study where we look at sudden deviation when people walk on the treadmill and the idea behind it is that they they adjust their gait speed at moments where they are not well positioned and and so we were interested in, in basically measuring the velocity the instant velocity of each stride as a way to decide how well a person regulates gait over four minutes, for example, or longer. And so that's really the reason why we, we, we were interested in uh, OptiTrack as a way to quantify gait. And you had a second question? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was, uh, uh, thank you for the first uh, answer. So the second question is about the correlation between uh, EEG outcomes and gait. Yes. We, we did correlations and I'm still working working on that. Um, I could show you them, but uh, they're not, they're not, um, I'm not happy with the way I'm analyzing it right now. There's, you can, you know, these modulation frequency bands, they, they are different for different people. So you wanna titrate the quantification to that person's modulation to really make sure you have a chance to to find a correlation you know that that is very subtle to begin with so that's but yes so i'm working on that that's a good question thank you mm -hmm. yeah thank you dr de sanctis just a quick question for you first sure. of all a uh, nice presentation and very thank interesting you. study um, i'm kai huang from uh, university of kansas medical standard physical, physical therapy Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it looks like the theta band uh, is a kind of a outcome measures that can give us show that that's significance given that the visual perturbation, uh, visual and proprioception uh, conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed that given the your research design, the visual conflicts that you're given is through the medial lateral using the virtual reality, right? So right. my question is that does this outcome, the significant outcome that we found from your preliminary da data is because of this direction dependent. Uh, what's your thought about, for example, if today I change uh, the the visual conflict in terms of their speed, which is anterior posterior changes, will you expect right. the same thing, or you think that that would be the other story? Probably can be found using, uh, for example, from mu band or the other uh, metrics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I would say. Um... There is a bunch of studies uh, that have people that have. Um, so we have one study where we have people standing actually and mm -hmm. exposed to that type of simulation. And we ask the question if, if how do they sway uh, interior, posterior, and bilateral? So, um, because optical flow in itself, when you stand, would. would propel you forward um, right. and so you would you would expect um, uh, anterior posterior uh, elevations of your of your uh, gait stability um, we, I have to say we did only find um, challenges uh, that they, we only found if I remember correctly we only found uh, increased uh, sway in the mm -hmm. lateral direction which uh was a little bit puzzling because they should they should uh, show this anterior posterior uh, so we, it was a question that we really didn't answer i would agree with you i, I think depending on on how you manipulate the, that visual uh, stimulus and how you create the okay. conflict will have mm -hmm. a different effect on especially where you stand still. Yep. Yeah. Yep, okay, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions?
Yeah. Um, hi, Philip. He's Patricia. Hi, Thank Patricia. You. Hi. How are you? That's wonderful. Thank you for making time. I know it's Friday afternoon and uh, such an important time. So thank you, everyone, for attending and. Uh, Thank you for making the time to share your so insightful and innovative research. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a question regarding the uh, duplication of this uh, uh, methodology. So thinking about some of our patients whom I already have uh, uh, mobility impairment and some mm -hmm. dysfunctional gait, um, did you ever validated with some other populations that uh, might not have asymmetric gait patterns that might already increase some possibility for noise and um, mm -hmm. a larger variance in your data. Mm -hmm. So we do have a collected data set on uh, individuals with a diagnosis of MS. So there we, um, but that data is unfortunately not not analyzed yet, so I don't really know what the signals there are. Um, but uh, if you invite me back, I will I will try to get that up and running so that we can I have a better answer to your question. I see lots of smile, <laughs> so that I can see that Noemi is already making a note <laughs> to put <laughs> to the. <laughs> now we would love to have you back, definitely. Excellent. And eventually, like even for our 2022 conference to have uh, uh, maybe organized with some of our experts like uh, Dr. Divus and Kaya uh, doing a one yeah. symposium. And I think that will be really interesting for the organization to learn more about the methodology. I am not familiar with uh, the system, the MOBI. Yeah. Uh, usually we work with those clinical gate laboratories like hospital base that uh, uh -huh. have several cameras and sensors. Uh -huh. And um, so I don't know how that differs and how much the technology is uh, different than what usually we use in our clinical gate instrumentation. Mm -hmm. But definitely will be interesting to learn more about it. And I'm sure our uh, field will appreciate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, actually, I have a question. <laughs> okay. So um, uh, I noticed that I actually got the question from Dr. Divas and Dr. Huang and Dr. Hines' um, questions. I was wondering if, if Mobi could be um, integrating noise, sound, like acoustics, because, and also, uh, earlier, you mentioned that with the visuals, they tend to increase their speed. So in, in my experience, um, but in, in the Philippines, actually, when they listen to music and if the, if the environment or the sound acoustics has a particular rhythm or, or, or a particular um, pacing, mm -hmm. not just music, they tend to move faster. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I was wondering if your Mobi it can also integrate um, sound or acoustics, maybe yeah. in the future or, or right uh, now, if you're working. Not in the future. There are very interesting studies actually done by Joanna Wagner, who, who works with me on on on, on my data. Uh, she's she, well, she used to be at University of San Diego, and she has done really excellent work on on acoustics. So what she did is she basically uh, presented not music, just uh, a tone, a series of tones uh, that required to, uh, so she met, first she measured, measured uh, the cadence of a person and then she started to present tones um, at that cadence. And then she either increased or decreased uh, the mm -hmm. rhythm. And the task was to adjust gate to that new rhythm and she found uh, very interesting very interesting signals uh, that have to do with response inhibition there's a whole cognitive system you know of uh, that is has to do with with response inhibition and typically uh, investigated with simple button press 
but not with gait. And so she could show that the prefrontal cortex becomes comes online, especially if you have to reduce. So if the tone is faster and you have to basically uh, make shorter, quicker steps, that is particularly challenging uh, for, for, for the brain, more though than increasing step width, because it's really uh, an, an, an inhibition to shorten your step compared to widen your step. And so she could, uh, she showed different signals with different challenges and is doing this now in Parkinson. Um, so that's really exciting work there. Yeah. Done with auditory stimuli. Wow, that's uh, that's really exciting work for me, <laughs> for me. Um, and one more question for you, Dr. Desanti. So um, you talked about theta waves for Moby. I was wondering if you also considered um, looking at the uh, memory or emotional readings of the brain, because um, in my experience, when I looked at patients with cognitive impairment, Mm -hmm. They usually have memory. They worked also on emotion and memory to maintain their balance mm -hmm. and also to increase their steps or to improve their walking. Mm -hmm. So there are patients who actually remember their mistakes. That's why they got better on the next try. So I was wondering if Moby also um, incorporates this um, data in, in your study. I mean, they are very, very interesting. Uh, lines of research in in actually in Moby. Uh, I mean, I'm not an expert, but but I have colleagues that, for example, showed that uh, when you walk through a or through a space, that the architecture uh, changes uh, your perception. Uh, that there's a real interaction between your perception and your environment. Uh, and and then there are uh, studies that look at dance and music uh, while you have an EG cap on and interactions between people when you have uh, so joint attention and uh, so all this more complex behavior social and and also with your environment um, these are all questions that uh, we now can answer because we can have people really behave in a more realistic way and interact while we measure brain activity. So uh, yes, there are really very interesting questions that now for the first time, I think in humans can be, can be asked and hopefully answered. All right, so I think we reached our clock, our, our time. So how about some last words? from Dr. Hein, our chairperson. Well, this was such a great presentation and um, thank you so much for making the time. Uh, we wanna bring you definitely back and having a awesome. day, usually Friday, it's hard for our organization. Um, usually pro our professionals are already off the clock at this time. And so it's especially in July, but definitely we're mm -hmm. gonna bring you back and uh, we're gonna look for future collaborations and also preparing some educational presentations with our experts here who attended today, who are many like gate researchers. And yeah. I think that's gonna really help in advance uh, many areas that we are doing research. So thank you for the work you do. Dr. Dick Santix and um, keep up with the good work and we are going to keep uh, monitoring and uh, contacting you. Excellent. Please stay in touch. I'm interested to learn more of your, you know, your end of research, your side of that. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of cross uh, interest. So I think that's going to be wonderful. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, yep. We will be sending you the uh, copy of the video. And if you have uh, questions for Dr. Desanti, please let us know and we'll forward the um, uh, email for you. Thank you and have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Desanti. Thank you. Thank you.